This is Colin Kruger with the final sprint of the Centipede project. So taking a look at my game, I currently have it running in a tractor mode. But if we, oh, I have to be on the window. Hit one, we start the first wave. Uh, I'm gonna mute it just for now. We'll get to sounds later. Uh, so currently we have uh, the player is able to move left, up, left, right, up, down. Player can only go up to a certain bounding box and can only come to this line right here, uh, which is basically the bottom of the screen. Um, additionally, our blaster fires one bullet at a, that was not intentional, <laughs> one bullet at a time, so it can only fire one, um, but if it hits something real close, it can fire uh, as long as there's only one on the screen. Um, taking a look at other features, uh, mushrooms currently have four lives, so one, two, three, four. Come on. Um, yep, and then... If we get killed, it'll regenerate and unpoison the mushrooms at the end of a round. So just for one more demonstration, one more demonstration like that. Oh well, that was the end of the game. Um, let's show a better example. Remute. So if I'm gonna poison that, that mushroom right there is gonna come back. All right. So yeah, that's what I have with regard to mushrooms. The centipede itself. Oh, currently you can see its poison stays working. Um, and when it hits the bottom of the screen, it starts coming back up, and you're going to notice it touches the top of the player's bounding box in a second, and it will come back down beyond that. So I will show you. Oh, see, it came back down, and this is the top of the player's bounding box. Uh, the centipede does split, so we can split it in the middle like so. We can kill an individual head. We can kill the head, and it replaces it like that, and we can shoot the back end off as well. Uh, so the centipede has all that. Uh, you notice that when it turns, it has a, uh, a uh, smooth turn as opposed to just heading straight down. Um, and yeah, uh, well, the game ended again. I currently have the high score set really low, but we'll get more into the high score system in a second. Uh, looking at the other creatures, currently I don't have fleas spawning on wave one. Scorpions don't either, but I put those for the demo. Uh, but let me quickly add fleas, or flea spawn, or sorry about that, can spawn fleas, my bad, and put a one, which is, uh, we'll get to this part later, mute. Uh, we'll get to this part later, but now fleas can spawn, so when I restart the game, on wave one, fleas will spawn if there aren't enough mushrooms, as so. They currently have two health, so I'll shoot one once, and you'll notice that it stays alive, but it does stop spawning mushrooms. Uh, taking a look at... I'm going to mute that again. Uh, taking a look at that, uh, the flea has a proper death animation. Um, let me get one to kill me here. Boom. It has the proper death animation for that. Um, taking a look at other elements, um, so we currently have the scorpion as well. The scorpion's going to poison that mushroom, uh, and it's going to disappear off screen. It can be shot for a thousand points as well, although that's not the easiest shot to hit. Oh, let's see if I can get this one. There we go, and I just got a thousand points from that. Mute again. Um, so yeah, the scorpion has full functionality as well. It's two cells wide and it creates poison mushrooms. And then finally, the spider has movement. It can only move in one direction. Uh, and it has variable distances to be killed. So really close, that's 900. If I manually spawn another one. Manually spawn another one. From really far distance, it's 300. And from like a medium distance, it's 600. So that's a look at all the critters. In the next, sec in the next segment, we're going to look at the mushroom field and some other elements here within and different game modes. So be right back. Caught another magic number. Fix that. So, uh, taking a look at the next section, um, with regard to the mushroom field, uh, you will notice that if I restart the game as so, that the boxes which hold the high scores uh, will block out to five digits. So currently it will go down through that. And when it hits this edge right here, uh, like so, it'll start uh, hitting against those, even though those aren't mushrooms, they're considered grid objects, and they will uh, hit against those. Uh, but when the, the centipede is back through here, normally it would be heading through letters, but currently those are taken care of. Um, additionally, looking at the different game modes, we are currently in single player. So 
if I die three times, so I'm just going to run into a few spiders. I'm manually spawning these spiders. Normally only one can spawn. Boom, three. Um, currently, this is enough for a high score, so I'm going to show you this high score with a, with a, 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 like so. And currently that'll be on the high score. But again, we'll get to that in a second. The, the attractor mode displays this high score, uh, but we are back in attractor mode and now we can head into two player mode. So currently we have a, this mushroom field for player one. But you'll notice that as we swap to player two, like so, it's a brand new mushroom field. However, if we get killed in this mode, We'll go back to the original mushroom field. So it does remember the different mushroom fields between the two players. So now I'm going to show you when both players run out of life. It'll send us back. Boom. So player one is fully dead. And player two is now dead. And no one scored a high score. So it takes us back to attractor mode. Now this is all the same demo. But uh, just for... Uh, everyone's sake we're gonna run it one more time where I'm just gonna kill myself over and over again in uh, this uh, in one player mode two and dead and we're back to attractor mode so uh, that's what I have for the different game modes um, oh looking at the high scores so you currently notice that we got the score of 911 at AAA uh, what's nice is that that high score will be saved. So if we escape out of the game and then head back into the game, you'll notice that the AAA score at 911 is uh, still there. One thing to note if you're testing this on your own is that using version control with Perforce, it does set files to read only if you haven't checked them out. So it will not be able to save your high scores if the, the file is in read only. So make sure you check that out if you want to test this for yourself. Uh, next, we're going to be taking a look at some scoring uh, within the game um, and uh, the wave control system. So taking a look at the wave system, let me close this out for a second. Currently we have what I would consider our pretty average game. Uh, these are what I thought the values were, but we can go infinite with these waves. Um, but looking at the centipede settings, uh, I describe very clearly how the designer would put in these things. And these are all the valid fields. So we have centipede length, speed, solo head count, solo speed, um, fleas, scorpions, and spiders, if they can spawn, uh, the flea trigger value, so that's the value of mushrooms that need to be in the lower half, or the lower, whatever, the player quadrant, and then the frequency of these two spawning, and then finally the spider speed. So, I'll show you an example of three distinct waves working. So in this first wave, there are no scorpions and no spiders, but we'll also set the length of the centipede to four. In the second wave, we're going to set the length of the centipede a little higher, so we're going to set it to ten, um, and we're going to have the flea be able to spawn in this setting as well. And then the third one will just go crazy, and we'll make the centipede with a length of 30, let's say. And we will make the solo head count equal to 15. So we just have a complete bombardment. So you see these current settings, and this is what we'll see. So if we look now at the first wave, you'll notice that's only four long, as we described earlier. Um, so we're going to complete this wave, and so I can show you it going to the second one. I'm going to try as quickly as I can, but the speed is not the fastest. All right. Almost there. And there, so now we saw in the second wave that the scorpion can spawn. Additionally, that is a centipede with a length 10, but we still only see one head. We haven't gotten to the massive dump yet. And scorpions can't spawn yet either. So we're gonna kill this big guy right here. Oh, do not kill me. All right. And... Almost done. There we go. And now we have insanity. Uh, hopefully the scorpion shows itself with this wave control, but we have many independent heads going off. I'll double check to make sure scorpions can spawn. I don't actually know if we set that or not. But currently we have 
a lot of wave control. Now notice how I died there. It's going to repeat the same wave. It's not going to go on to the next wave. So that's what we have there, but also taking a look at two player mode, it will remember the difference between waves. So this first one here, we're going to complete wave one. Oh, that solo head appears to have spawned inside the original head. So let's get to wave two on this guy. Just gonna hit this one. Sorry about that. There we go. So we're on wave two here. We're going to get ourselves killed and go to player one, where the centipede length is back to four. However, if player one doesn't complete this wave, so we don't complete the wave, we go to player two, and he's back on the one with the centipede, being at ten, as so. There are the solo head. There is the solo head. And voila. So that's what we have for two player as well. Uh, that all works fine, and just to show you that it resets again, I'm going to get myself killed by just spawning a crap ton of scorp uh, centipedes. Again, back on wave one. Come on. And I'm just going to get us to the end. Um, sir. Only player two is left alive. All right, so player one scored a high score, so we're going to put the initials for player one. There we go, and that was the second highest high score, and it gets inputted right there. So, um, additionally, looking at scoring, I'm going to shoot each of the entities and show you the proper scoring is working. We'll get into the code of how that works later. So, uh, we are currently at a score of zero. If I spawn a spider, it, I showed earlier the variable scoring. Boom, 600, and you'll notice up top left, we have a score of 600. Shooting a centipede head is worth 100, but the body is only worth uh, 10. So if we shoot, oh, that missed. Come on, get back here. Missed again. There we go. That was only 10 points, but if we shoot a head, it's 200, or 100 points. So, uh, that's what we have for scoring there. Um, we are going to then go back into our wave control really quickly. And, oh, looking at wave three, I uh, am going to take these scorpion, undo. I'm gonna take these scorpion values and allow them to be within wave one. Um, so if we go back to wave one, we can look at the different scoring here as well. So if I manually spawn a score, which number did I look at? Oh, my bad, I mistyped something. Uh, can spawn scorpions. My bad about that, I actually forgot to save the wave settings file. So now we'll see a scorpion appear in this mode and on wave one so i just spawn two there when i hit one i get a thousand points uh when i hit a spider oops <laughs> not that kind of hit uh but yeah i demonstrated the variable scoring earlier and i'll go 600 there uh and then when i get a flea which actually will not spawn this wave but getting to wave two isn't that bad almost there there we go, at wave two, if we clear enough of these mushrooms out. Oh, also, mushrooms score one point on kill. So there's a flea right there. Fleas will spawn 200 points. I didn't feel confident enough to kill that one. There we go, 200 points for that guy. So we're at 3141. Oh, please don't kill me. Yeah, so you saw all that working. Um, if there, are, I think I got all the scoring elements, so I'm going to mute this. Um, looking forward to the next section, uh, we are going to take a look um, at the remainder of things, including the high score system, and then we'll get into the code. So, be right back. All right, so finally in this part one, we're gonna take a look at high scores. So currently we have a text document that saves all our high scores. So let's just lower a few of these down. So I can show you the top of the screen. So currently these are our high scores. And if we go like this, start the game, you'll notice at the top of the screen, 60 is our high score. So if we start a new game and I kill the scorpion, we're already at 600 and the score is now updated. The high score at the top middle of the menu is updated alongside our score. 
Um, and I can show you when we lose our final life that this will now be the new high score for our game. So I am going to put the initials A, B, C. And currently ABC is at the top of the leaderboards with 12.30. If I exit the game, as I showed earlier, uh, we have 12.30 is the new high score. Um, so, yep, uh, but so normally you shouldn't go in here and change these manually, uh, but so if we set this high score ridiculously high, we can see the high scores up top all reflect this as well. So, anyway, in part two, we're going to look at the different code elements that we have for the centipede. So, thank you so much for watching. So, starting here in part two, we're going to take a look at our profiles and all of our different player entities. So, coming over here, we have a profile manager. This profile manager is a singleton. Um, now, I can go to profile manager and show you that this is done correctly. So currently we have a static instance and a static get instance. All of our public functions are static. All of our private, uh, all of our non-static functions are private. So we have that set up correctly. Anyway, making our way back. So currently our profile manager holds a reference to the current player, which can be either player one, player two, or player AI. Now this can expand if we have multiple, even more players, but this is all the implementation that we need right now. Each profile, has a few different fields. So first say as a controller type, so player one could for instance be using a keyboard and player two be using a joystick. Although a joystick is not implemented, it would be very easy to do so if I had a joystick. <laughs> uh, and if it was part of the program which or it was part of the assignment which it was not so looking at some of the other fields it has bonus count this is basically just a field to say how many times you've hit the bonus so far um, the field ID so this is the mushroom field ID uh, how many lives uh, you have left uh, what your current score is what your wave ID is and then two others we have attached bullet and the ship a pointer to the ship now we'll get back to the attached bullet in a second because I do want to speak on that but firstly taking a look at the ship uh, you might uh, so the ship currently can have all of its move functions here. It handles a new game, a new round, and each profile has its own ship. So uh, we have these move functions. Now the move functions don't actually say anything about keyboards. That'll be in an, our input manager. So currently they just move when called. So what calls them? Well, up here, uh, this is a large diagram, but uh, down here in input controller. Uh, I didn't go with a uh, strategy pattern here. I went with something slightly different using function pointers, uh, and I will get to that later when we talk about the game uh, controller and the input controller. But if we come here to the keyboard settings, so currently we have a uh, check for when the keyboard is it's in keyboard mode. It'll check for the WASD keys and then it'll send a signal to the profile manager, which sends it uh, to the current player and it will tell them to move left, which will then tell the ship to move left. So, uh, so keyboard is currently separated from the ship. Other than that, um, the ship does not have anything to do with shooting. I thought that while the ship looks like it's doing the shooting, they are really two separate entities and both connected by their profile, which is why I have this attached bullet here. So I'm gonna get into that now. So currently we have a bullet object uh, that is deprecated, sorry, that I can actually show you goes nowhere in a second. If we go here, it doesn't go anywhere. Whereas, uh, well, I'll show you in a second that that is deprecated and not used, but other than that, um, we take a look, a bullet has position, all that. Uh, the bullet also has a shoot state. Now, the shoot state allows us in the update function for the bullet to not have to call an if. Simply all we do is call update. Uh, and based on which of the types of uh, states we're in, I can show you right now. If we're in fire mode, that update will call uh, this function, which will move the bullet. If it's attached, it will keep it with the ship. So that's currently what we have, and this is a strategy pattern. So currently we have, this is a virtual abstract void um, update. And then each of these two will implement a different strategy based on the current state. And to show you that I have done this correctly as well, we can look 
no further than we have, where is it, bullet.cpp. Um, we in initialize only the shoot state and the attached state once. And then when we destroy the object, or when we delete the bullet, uh, we delete these two things. Uh, it's not when it's destroyed, it's when it's deleted specifically. Um, so at the end of the program. So that's what we have for that. Um, taking a look at how the bullets work and how this uh, attached bullet works. So essentially when we shoot, we're going to call something in the profile from the profile manager. And we're gonna say, if we have a bullet, because there are times, times where our player doesn't have a bullet, we're gonna play the sound um, and we're going to tell that bullet to shoot itself. Uh, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, so we're gonna, but yeah, we're gonna ask the bullet to shoot itself, and then we're gonna request a new bullet for the attached bullet. However, in the mode where there's only one bullet on screen at a time, this shouldn't return anything, and it doesn't. So if we actually look, uh, this sets a flag for us with a type of observer pattern or a modification to an observer pattern. So if I go to the definition here, uh, the private, sorry about that. Um, essentially what's going to happen is it's going to say, all right, the amount of bullets on screen, can we, uh, is, can we make another one? If we can't, if there are too many bullets on screen, we're gonna set this excess request flag to true. And then we're gonna return it a null pointer. So essentially it's not going to have a bullet to be able to shoot. Uh, otherwise, we'll get a new bullet if there can be multiple bullets on screen. However, we're not going to check every frame if we can get a new bullet. This flag right here is only going to be checked whenever we recycle a bullet. Because the amount of bullets we can summon on a screen isn't going to change, what we're going to uh, we're going to only check this when we recycle a bullet. So when we recycle a bullet, we'll ask, "Hey, do we have an excess request?" If we do, uh, reset that flag to false and then to give the player fulfill its request from earlier so this is notifying the system back so if we go to this definition it's going to take us back to the profile manager um hold on where were we i can go back to the class diagram yeah so it's essentially going to take us uh when we fulfill that bullet request it's going to take us back to the profile manager which is going to then fill the request to the current profile so uh, that's currently the system that we have for the profile manager. So taking a look at our mushroom fields, this is the next section. Um, the first thing we're gonna notice is that we have a mushroom field manager. This is in charge of handling all of our mushroom fields. Uh, so currently we only need two. Uh, the field for player one and the field for player two. I didn't feel it was necessary to have a specific field for the uh, the AI. So currently we only have a field one and a field two, and we just use field one whenever we're in AI mode. Don't worry, it resets. So essentially with our mushroom field manager, each one has a mushroom field. Each mushroom field has a field, and that field is a two-dimensional array. Um, and that two-dimensional array is filled with grid object references. So, uh, specifically, if you want to take a look, uh, it is <laughs> a triple pointer to a grid object. Uh, this is instantiated as a 2D array of pointers. So, this points to a grid object. Now, a grid option object can be one of two things. It can either be a mushroom or an invisible barrier. Now, the invisible barrier is what we see in a tractor mode. Now, so the text is not actually connected to the um, the blocking that the centipede has. Those are two different entities. Uh, but what the invisible barrier does is it has some of the mushroom implementation, but not all of it. It doesn't have HP. It doesn't have any of these fields. It just has a sprite. And that sprite is nothing. It's just a null sprite or there's nothing in there. Uh, but it needs it to be able to draw it within a certain area. So we have an invisible barrier and then we also have a mushroom. Now the mushroom is uh, more interesting. So the mushroom is a game or a grid object and the grid object itself is a game object. Um, it has a few different things. It has um, activation and deactivation. I'll get to that at the very end. Uh, it has collision. So currently has collision with a spider, a player, 
and a bullet. So if it collides with a bullet, it loses a point of HP, and it's going to call update sprite. Now what update sprite does is it checks, do we have HP? Uh, if we do have HP, then it's just going to say go to the next frame, and that's that. We've already lost the HP up here. But if we don't have any more HP, it's going to ask the manager, hey, uh, I need you to remove this from the field. And that's going to send a score command to our score manager, and that's going to mark itself or destroy. So uh, that's what happens whenever we update a sprite. It's not checking every frame for the HP of every single object. It only updates the sprite every time it takes damage. Otherwise, it's just going to draw it every frame. So going back to the class diagram, um, we have a few functions. Like we can check if something's poisoned. We can heal it to full during the regeneration cycle. Um, which simply is just going to play the animation, play the sound, uh, whenever it's called. Um, back to the class diagram. Um, so those are some of the things that a mushroom does. Uh, yeah, so the mushroom's going to send its score commands whenever those things happen. So it actually does have two score commands you saw up here. It has P regenerate and P death. Death is when it dies. That's a score command for one point, but again, that can be changed in the definitions. And regenerate, um, that's what ha the five points you get when it regenerates during that whole cycle. So uh, we have that. Now, looking at how the regeneration works, uh, I couldn't really find too many specifics of how the regeneration actually works in the game, so I took my best guess at how the system works. I'm not sure if it's correct or not, but it looks similar enough to the IGN version, but if a designer wants something else, uh, it doesn't look like it would be too much more to implement with the robust system that I have here. Essentially what happens is it's going to call uh, regenerate column. So essentially it's every few frames uh, after that kill screen goes um, in the game manager, it's going to regenerate a new column on the screen. If there's a column that has a mushroom, it's going to tell it to heal to full. And then it'll call this, which will heal it to full and play the animation if necessary. So uh, that's what we have for that. Back to the class diagram. So it's going to regenerate each column, and each column is going to call the regenerate uh, and the heal to full things on that. Uh, it Interestingly enough, does not call it, um, it doesn't actually do anything if you call it on a invisible barrier. It only does something if you call it on the mushroom. Now, now we get to the first point where it is not we are probably one of the only points where we have something that is less than ideal, something that just, if time permits, did not permit. Um, and that was um, to do with basically not being able to uh, handle uh, swapping fields in a way where we have separate... Let me restart. It, it does not handle fields. So let me just show you, actually. That would probably be the best thing. So currently, in our update function, we have something very nasty and should be avoided. Um, or hold on. Uh, hold on. And found it. So I have this nasty if statement called should draw. Now, this is the only thing that I wasn't actually able to get to. Essentially, what happens is that if the field current field is active, draw it. If it's not, then just don't do anything. This is a very bad if statement and was really the only thing I didn't get to. Um, and this subsequently does mean that I'm unable to deregister the game object from the field when it is not active. So currently, even when a field is inactive, it is still going to call update every frame, unfortunately. Um, but so that which is unfortunate, it does re deregister the collision. So it's not checking the collision every single time, but it does call update, which does lose a decent amount of performance. And this is probably the biggest thing that I have uh, wrong with this thing that I wasn't able to get to. So ignoring that, or <laughs> if you will, um, looking at some other things. So when a mushroom is destroyed so what happens is currently we have mushrooms uh when they are destroyed they are sent back to an object pool uh, now visual studios class diagrams do not do a good job of illustrating this but um 
when an object is requested, uh, so we have mushroom field, where would that be? Oh, not grid option, mushroom field. Uh, so in a mushroom field, um, specifically in a, the mushroom field manager, we have this function. So if we go to its definition, uh, it is going to uh, spawn a mushroom, which then when coming over here is going to basically, it's going to add, it's going to request a mushroom from this mushroom factory. We currently have it called it mushroom controller, but it is a factory. And essentially what that factory does is it, uh, when you request a mushroom, it'll give you a grid object, although it's, it, it is a mushroom when you request a mushroom. Uh, and it is going to, if we follow the chain, uh, it is going to get a mushroom from our object pool. So currently we are pooling objects. So I can show you at the very end that we are not creating all these different news. Uh, we are only calling new every so often. So at max we'll have maybe 50 to 60 mushrooms um, ever created in their lifetime. So if we come to this object field, which itself is a singleton, uh, looking back, it didn't probably need to be a singleton as it probably could have been a single instance without within the controller, which is also a singleton, but it's what we currently have. It's not that big of a deal. Uh, it just doesn't show up very well in the class diagram. But yeah, so um, it's going to get a new mushroom from the object pool. Oh, let me just get that, get mushroom. Uh, currently, if we don't have a new mushroom to give, give it a new mushroom. Um, but if we do have one, register it to the current scene and then return it from the top of the list. And then of course, take it out of that list. So we have a basic factory with an object pool set up for our mushrooms. Um, so uh, other than that, uh, that's pretty much the system that we have for our mushroom field. Uh, and yeah. So after my mic died, I lost all my centipede footage. So I'm going to try this again. So um, we're going to now talk about the centipede. So uh, the centipede by far has the most associated classes with over 20. So looking at where well, we're going to start here at the centipede manager. Now the centipede manager is in charge of different centipedes. A centipede is an entity that has a head and an end and it's the whole segment um, of that centipede. So each centipede itself has a reference to the head and the end which is basically it holds a doubly linked list, um, which are what the centipede nodes are, which has a next, a previous, and a reference to the segment. Now, the segment right here is a, currently a parent class of the head and the body, which do have a few different things, but for the most part behave in the same way with just a few exceptions, including how it gets the next grid frame and uh, different uh, splitting implementations and so on and so on. But the big one here is the next grid frame. So looking, but firstly, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the centipede itself, the entity, and we're going to take a look at the split function. Now, what the split function does is it is only called when the centipede gets to the next. So essentially we put in a split request uh, for a specific segment and we can have multiple split requests and then it's going to call split on all of those. So if we have a basic scorpion, so I'm or not scorpion, a basic centipede where we have a head like this, and then a body like this. If this one is killed, it's going to wait until, uh, if this is on like frame six, it's gonna wait till frame eight, and then it's going to update that this one's not here anymore, we'll put a mushroom there, and then it's gonna tell this one, now check your state, and then it's going to appropriately turn down. But what can also happen is that multiple within that eight frame or however fast the centipede is, whatever that centipede grid is, uh, two can be updated. So what happens is it actually updates from the back. So what happens first is it is going to say, all right, we're gonna split here. This one's gonna be just set to an end and this one is gonna become a new head. Then we're going to call it on this one. And now that this is just an end node, we don't actually have to go through the business of creating a new head. 
And so we get left with this segment, this segment, and uh, this segment without either of these two. Um, so that's what we have for that, don't save. Um, but essentially I'll show you how the split works. So currently we have this part right here, which basically just checks if the centipede, if this is the end of the centipede, then we don't need all this fancy stuff. We just uh, crop the end of the centipede and that's all we have to do. If this is the generic case, well, we, we have to do something a little more complicated. We essentially create a new centipede object. That centipede object gets initialized with we already have data. We don't need to create a new head and a new end. We already have that data. So we have this initialize with data function. And all that does is it sets the next and the uh, this top or the head and the end of our new centipede. Then we upgrade our head. So looking at upgrade head, uh, this is going to take me through to here. Um, essentially what we're doing is we take the input from a body and we return a head. And this is all stuff uh, with regard to pooling, but this one in particular is going to copy all of the data from our body to our head. Uh, then what happens is after that happen, uh, after that we mark the old uh, segment for destroy, not the segment we passed in, but the thing that the body is replacing. We set it to a head. We tell the old centipede, hey, uh, your your new end does not have a next. Uh, it no longer points to this p seg. It points to no pointer. Um, then we go through all of them, we set them other, um, and then we delete the node that we actually came here for by marking it for destroy. Uh, so that's what we have there. Um, looking here though, we did have a, we do have a dip different implementation for when it's the head being killed. So currently our split function, even though it's a segment, it only really takes in a centipede body. The head, on the other hand, is only kill, called by when the head is destroyed. So when the head is destroyed, we don't need to do as much, and the process is slightly different. So if it's the only thing in the list, great. We just recycle it and return it, the function. But if it's not the end of the list, all we're doing here is upgrading the head and then changing the pointers by one, or just shifting the head back by one. Uh, so that's all we're doing here. You also may notice that we have this little section right here. All that we're doing is because of what I showed you earlier with how it's going to check for the split and the kill at the current frame, or uh, it's basically it you put in a split or kill request, and then at the top of the frame it's going to do that. We have to get the current grid offsets so it doesn't put it where it was. It's going to put the mushroom where it now is as it's dying. So, uh, and the the split function has the exact same thing. Uh, so going back to the class diagram. We have our centipede manager once again, and we are going to take a look at our update function. Now, our update, which is priv update, definition, uh, it does a few things. So firstly, what it does is it's going to update these two tickers. The reason we need two is because the heads can move at different speeds than the uh, the grid act or the main centipede does. Um, this works if it's faster or slower, both work. Um, so essentially it's going to check, um, all right, is this number equal to how many frames we ha should have per update? And that's actually determined by the wave. Um, the wave has this data only only because it's a factor of how fast the centipede is moving. So essentially what we do is we reset that ticker right here uh, once we're at this correct amount of frames. Uh, and we are calling the split update function. Now with the split update function, it's necessary because our container is going to change size after this. And so we can't have the split update and the update in the same place. And all of these need to come before even the first update here. So when we call split update, uh, we essentially, um, this is a redundant if request and I'm gonna take care of that immediately. But essentially um, what happens is that we ask, has there been a split requested? If so, we do that thing where we start from the back and continue forward, release, erase that from our request list and every single time uh, we are going to then call that split function I showed earlier. So once all the splitting has been done, 
moving back to the update function. Come on, uh, go to definition. Uh, once all of that splitting is done, it's going to base. It's going to check. Do we have anything to recycle? Uh, our recycle. So just like the splitting, recycling is only going to happen at the end of each frame cycle. So we have a list of things to recycle and we put in recycle requests. And then this finally recycles them all and clears that list. Um, then we get to call update. Now our lists of centipedes will likely have changed if one of these things has done anything, uh, which is why we need to put it in a separate place. Um, and then this right here basically checks, this right here basically checks if we uh, have requested a new centipede to be spawned. Now, centipedes usually are only spawned at the start of the, the game. However, there is no, if you, um, one needs to be spawned manually, for instance, this is there just as a safeguard. Um, and this testing feature and this future implementation only comes at the cost of a single if. So, but it can be removed if our implementation is finalized. So, Looking right here, we also have the solo frames list, um, which is for the solo heads, and all it's doing is the same thing as the main list of centipedes, but these are moving at different speeds, so they have to update at different times. Um, additionally, while we only really want to spawn one centipede at a time, because they all spawn in the same place and that would mean nothing to spawn two in the same location, um, the heads can spawn all across the the, uh, the x-axis, so we could theoretically ask for multiple ones, and at the beginning of the round we do, in fact, so that's why we have this heads to spawn. So, looking back at our class diagram, we also have two separate object pools. One pools the centipedes themselves, this, like, holder of this the segments in the list, um, and this other one, oops, did not mean to click there. This other one over here is going to hold a stack of our bodies and a stack of our heads. Um, these are not implemented as singletons because they only get uh, implemented once, but the manager itself is a singleton. So essentially we have a reference to this object pool. Uh, so this is our segment pool. So for instance, if we request a head, go to definition. If we request a head, it's going to ask the segment pool for a head. Uh, and this works just like all object pooling that I have so far. So if we look at the segment object pool, it's probably better if we actually go and look at the functions. So request centipede head. Uh, so it's going to check if the list is empty. And it's, yeah, it's basically going to work how any object pool in this program works. Uh, you can take a sec to read this if you'd like, but moving on, uh, the same thing happens with the centipedes. Um, I'll quickly show that code. If Hold on. I'll quickly show that if you need to see it, but essentially it works the exact same way. Um, and these trace commands um, are put in right now just to show you uh, with our final demonstration for how objects are being created, it will just show you everything you need to see. So now we get to the fun part where we look at move states. So currently we have this git move state, or not git move state, sorry. We have, where are you? There it is, move state. Now this move state is a reference to this class, which currently has 11 children. Um, this is a finite state machine. Essentially what's happening is um, we have, an it points to an offset array. Now this offset array, now this offset array is a collection of different offsets depending on how we want to move. So we currently have seven different offset types. Now these offsets are only ever calculated once and that is at the beginning of the code. And I will show that in a second, but if we look at our offset collection, which is just a collection of all of our offsets, we have, uh, we'll go to this definition here. Uh, so we have, each of these is a different type of offset. So we have straight right, straight left, blah, 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 blah. Now this function here calling a new offset, uh, let me go to this, perfect. This only gets called at the very beginning because what we did here in the offset collection 
Um, we established these once, and we established this before the game even begins running. Um, so if we look at, oops, wrong one. Offsite collection leads to offsets. Oh, that must have come off. No matter. And then, perfect. Sorry about that. Um, we can see that uh, it's going to ask for what type of offset it uh, we're at. It's also going to calculate the speed. Uh, so. It's going to basically create an array of offsets based on our max speed. So currently, this can be set higher, but in our definitions, oops, uh, in our definitions, we only have five different speeds: zero, one, two, three, four. Um, and back to ah, I keep losing that. My bad. Let's just go to. So looking back at this function, essentially what we're doing is we're creating a array of a uh, we're creating a two-dimensional array of different offsets based on how many speeds we permit. So by default, I have this set to five different speeds, um, but you can include more. Although including more doesn't mean a whole lot, uh, or it's just going to create something so abysmally slow that it's not going to be usable or so incredibly fast that again it's not going to be useful so essentially what i'm doing is creating an array so if i have a size of or a speed of zero so one two three four uh, essentially what i'm doing is i'm taking two to that power so two to zero is one and i'm dividing that by 16. Uh, for the amount of frames at that speed. So 16 divided by 1 is 16 frames. So that offset array has a size of 16 frames. Similar here, if we take 16 divided by 2 to the 1, we get 8, 4, 2, and 1 frame, which is what speed 4 represents. Um, interestingly, if we increase this number to the max speed count to like 8, then uh, the formula does change but it does handle for it but I found that the most the most meaningful set is just these speeds here so that's currently what I have implemented um, the only in other interesting things here is uh, so it sets uh, it does the math accordingly it's just a bunch of math here this long thing is just talking about si uh, getting the smooth turns so use some sine cosine using the F for optimization using floats not doubles which is important um, so yeah, that's what I have there. So coming back to the move states here. Um, so we have this function here called get next state, which returns a move state to itself or a move state of its own kind. Now, this is just an abstract class. It doesn't do anything, but all of its children have this function get next state defined. And this is what makes up our state machine. So for instance, let's say we have move left down. So this means that we are heading left and our, our Y direction is down, not up. So this is a fairly common one. So if we expand this out, we can actually take a look at the get next state, which is overwritten here. So firstly, when this is created, it's setting the offset array and the grid array for this particular one. Uh, and then what it's doing is it's checking ahead. Uh, this is only called when the centipede asks for it. And the centipede head only asks for it every amount of speed frames. Uh, as we discussed earlier, the speed can frames can actually depend. but it's only asking for this every so often. It's not calling it every single frame unless our speed is that fast. Um, so each one has a different logic to it. I can quickly show all of the different, or that's not gonna be useful. I can show a few different ones. So looking at get next state, go to definition. Um, certain things like the, up, like the switch. So this one here is going to switch into an upright. Um, 
So if it's not blocked, it's just going to switch us up and do an upright. Otherwise, there are a few other conditions here, but uh, this is not a big switch statement. So this is uh, significantly more efficient than that kind of query. So uh, I can assure you all of our things do that. Um, move state halt uh, is not. Uh, this should never be uh, because the head will never start in halt. It's only the bodies that start in halt and only the head calls this, which is important. So if we look at the difference between a centipede head and a centipede body, which would be in centipede or no, centipede. Uh, so if we look at the difference between a body and a head, a body, when it says to get the next grid frame, is just calling the parent, uh, which is saying reset the frame counter, get the new grid positions, but it is not asking for the next one. Whereas if we come to next grid frame, we are actually calling on the move state to get the next state. So it's only one thing that's checking it and it's passing its movement on to the rest and that can actually be seen in our update function for our centipede so if we look at update it is calling this next grid frame but only when it's called on a head does it actually do something otherwise it's just inheriting the movement from the previous one so uh, that's what we have for that portion of the centipede um, one more thing I would like to uh, assure you of is that when we are so for instance in this get next state we are using an offset collection these are constant things that are established once and only once so if we go to the definition specifically here uh, these are constant static. They are declared once and only once and are never created again. This I can show you in sort of the summation slash checking stage, which is sort of what part three of this video will be. So uh, looking ahead to my implementation of the critters. So this includes the spider, the flea, and the scorpion. So all of these are children of the critter class. The critter class holds something that all of them share, which is a texture, a bitmap, a position, and then a grid position as well, including HP. All of these have HP to some extent, although really the, the flea is the one that has the multiple HP. But each of these have specific things to themselves. The spider has its random movement controls and its velocity. Um, the flea has um, its basically its grid update. So it's not updating every time. It's only upgrading on a new grid space. Um, it also has its AI. So its AI is actually, well, let's actually dive into this a little bit. We have full health AI. So if we view the code on this, we have low health AI and full health AI. Full health AI is going to spawn mushrooms. So this is when it still has full health. However, when its health is equal to one, when we shoot it for the first time, we're gonna set its AI to become this low health AI. This is again using function pointers. Um, and its low health AI is just moving at its new enhanced speed. So that's all that's doing. Uh, back to the diagram. Um, additionally, uh, the scorpion has its horizontal velocity as it does not move up and down unlike the spider, uh, and it checks uh, vertically until its next grid space X. So um, yeah, so that's what we have for these. Um, all of these critters um, are held within are controlled by one controller created by one factory and sent to one object pool so uh, like i had earlier all of these are singletons right now even the object pool although it might not need to be it doesn't hurt that it is the object pool uh works just like an object pool it has a stack of fleas scorpions and spiders um, our factory is the thing that is taking these requests, so uh, recycling these things and also requesting these things. Um, and then these con the controller specifically here is doing something slightly different uh, than the factory. It's basically, it, it can receive certain requests to pass down the chain, uh, but it also uh, keeps a list of all of the live animals or the live critters. So the live fleas, the live scorpions, and the live spiders. This is nice because when we need to kill all critters, we just refer to this list and we just uh, basically take it all out. 
Um, uh, in addition to that, we also have these functions here. These basically catch the death of the flea, the scorpion, and the spider. And if we go to the definitions of these functions, essentially we need this, basically we are observing um, the scorpion and it sends a command back to us. This is our receiver command. Um, and when this happens, it takes its it out of the list and it stops the sound. Uh, I feel certain that we can stop the sound here as there is only ever one scorpion on screen at a time. So uh, we have all that. The control R also pushes the sounds um, when things are spawned. As spider, scorpion, and flea, they should only ever have one on the screen at a time. Now, in our update function, we have the current way I'm spawning things is I have a timer based on frames, and this can be adjusted, but it seems to work basically how the game works. Um, essentially, we have a, every so often, we ask, okay, can we spawn a spider? If we can, all right, do we have the random number to be able to, basically, we roll a random number based on the chance that we get from the specific wave. If the wave says we can do it, cool, we spawn the spider. Um, same with the scorpion. Uh, flea, we ask the mushroom field manager, hey, do we need one? Um, and it'll say, uh, this is not controlled by the frame timer, by the way. Do we need a flea? If we do, uh, then spawn a flea. Otherwise, don't. Um, this could probably, now that I'm looking at it right now, could probably be be done a little bit better with an observer, but alas, uh, the project is finished. Um, so, uh, to make a few assurances, um, taking a look at the update function, which calls uh, the full health AI, this is when we're dropping mushrooms, it's not checking every single frame to update the mushrooms. It's asking, basically, hey, so with our flea, have we gotten to the next grid space? Uh, in the grid space, uh, everything's defined by the size of the player. So are we within the player size? If we have gotten onto a new frame, uh, then we subtract that and we spawn a mushroom uh, based on the flea's chance. So this is the flea's spawn mushroom. So coming to the flea's spawn mushroom, it uses a random chance to spawn the mushroom. I think I have this set to like 40% or something, uh, but uh, that obviously can be changed. Um, so yeah, that's what I have for that. Uh, Scorpion does the same thing. So looking at the update for this thing, it checks the grid frames, yada, yada, yada. Um, and it will only poison a mushroom every time it hits a new grid. So that's what I have for that. Continuing on. The final thing to note about the critters is that they have a death command. So all of them have, the critter actually holds this pdeath command, but each of them when in initialized has something different, or actually, yeah, instantiated, my bad. Um, the scorpion itself uh, has the scorpion killed, and we'll get to the score manager uh, in a little bit, but it holds the scorpion killed command, the flea holds the flea killed command, and the spider as the same thing. Um, so let's go on to actually right now to talk about the score system. So, uh, looking at the score system, uh, this uses the command pattern. So essentially what I have here is I have, I know this is laid out weird. This is just so the arrows could be in the right place, but honestly they could be down here as well. It just is a little confusing with arrows. Uh, essentially we have this score command and a score manager, which I'll move over here. Uh, so the score command here only has a single function, execute, um, uh, and it has two children classes. This is completely uh, virtual or abstract. Um, the score command by value just has points. That's all it needs. Um, so a scorpion might drop a thousand points, a flea might drop 200 points. These are example of by value. By distance is only the spider for now but it has three tiers of distances. It has a distance far, distance medium, and distance near, which also has a value for that score, value for that medium, and value for that near. We also have the distance, the actual distance passed in. So, um, it might not, uh, so only the distance one actually has this command, get distances. 
um, and specifically this is just going to get this value because we need this value to be able to make this calculation and it's going to basically compare it so if we actually go to the execute function here uh, it's going to check uh, if within distance near add the near score if within medium instead add medium otherwise add far um, and then we have this which is printing out this but this will be off of the test all the traces will not uh, will be taken out in the final product. So then we have this add score command. Now this add score takes an integer um, and is called by uh, these uh, ex different execute commands. Uh, it's just going to add the score. So if we look into add score, go to definition. Oh yeah, uh, priv add score, go to definition. Uh, if we take a look here, what this is doing is it is adding the score to a certain player. Now, uh, what happens though is that the players are requesting the score manager, not the score command. There's no score command manager. This is just a score manager. So every frame, it's going to receive a certain amount of score commands, and it's going to process scores at the end of each frame. So it's going to go through this list, and it's going to call execute on each one. Um, additionally, we also have this check here for if we hit the bonus um, on our scores, we play that bonus sound, and we give it a bonus life. Uh, this is the place that it makes most sense for me, as it is most... It is a... Basically, it is notifying uh, these things that, hey, this has happened. But other than that, it's executing each time and popping it off the stack. Um, and so we have ba a basic command pattern here. Um, these are the different score commands. And then when we send it a score command, we're just pushing it onto the queue. So um, looking forward, we also have a high score manager, which doesn't have that much interactivity with the regular score manager. The high score manager keeps two fields. It keeps a highest score and the list of scores. This highest score is important to be separated out as so we don't have to keep accessing the, the top of the list every time we need to update the score on the top of the screen, specifically the current high score because sometimes this high score is changing with the game and we don't want to make requests to add to the high score list every single time that we get a score the score increases so um the first thing we do is we're going to actually we parse this file called highscores.txt uh so currently this is all it looks like um we never have to fill this out manually ever again um, but essentially, if we look at this high scores.txt, so if I'm going to save that and I'll run the game, it will parse this uh, high score manager. It's going to parse that file and it's going to put those scores there. Um, oops, that was an old one that I just never saved. Anyway, um, so it's going to write back to that file uh, at the end. So let me just show you the code for this. So um oh this is the exit one um on creation so we have this read in high scores from high scores.txt now this file name i don't foresee changing but it probably could be a definite uh something defined uh elsewhere uh but essentially we are going to come down to where is it uh, read in high scores, which is right here. And essentially this is reading the high scores. So it's just parsing. It takes the number and then after the number, it looks for a space. And then after the space, we have the different, um, the first three initials uh, and those initials are pushed back. And then at the end, it's going to resize uh, the list to eight in case something happens where it, you have like a ninth high score, uh, like someone manually goes in and enters it. Um, but ideally that shouldn't happen. <laughs> so um, looking uh, also, uh, when we exit, we're also gonna open the file and we're just going to print this um, using an OF stream. We're just gonna print this back to the file in the same data form that we had previously. So it does uh, load and uh, the files in and then it put, puts them back correctly. So um, additionally looking at uh, how high scores work. So currently what we have is a function that checks if 
both players got a high score. So if both players got a high score, it works slightly differently as it's going to first ask the player in first place to input their initials and then the player in second place to input their initials as well. Um, and then we have this add high score command. Now what's happening in the game manager is that it's asking, uh, it basically asks for this Boolean here, do both players need a high score? If both players need a high score, then it's actually going to run this twice. Uh, the second time it runs it, it's not going to have the higher player score, so it can just check the other player. So, um, essentially we have this being updated uh, with respect to multiplayer if both players get a high score. Otherwise, it's only going to run once, and that's going to be in our Game Manager HS loop, which I think we probably should talk about the Game Manager in a little bit. So, uh, let's go look at that, actually. So, the Game Manager was where all the logic for the game itself is managed. Um, it is not a game object, but it is a singleton. Um, in fact, I think we can look over here. It is a singleton. It is not a game object, though which is a problem because we wanted to update every frame like it is a game object. So we just have this small little function right here. Uh, where does, is it? Uh, oh, I might not have put it on the map actually. Um, it is very simply a game manager updater. Uh, so all this is doing is, let me find the dot H, game manager updater. This is simply a game object that is telling the game manager to update telling it to draw when it needs to draw and telling it to terminate when it terminates. So it has all of the things that a game manager needs, but it doesn't need to be a game object. So uh, what happens here is that we set a bunch of our initial variables. We create our new fields. We create our new game modes. Um, I'll get to game modes in a second, but uh, we create these game modes and uh, we uh, put our input. Our input is going to start as AI because we start in attractor mode and then we <laughs> we set the volume which is very important for this demo run although ideally this is at full volume in arcade or whatever the appropriate volume is and then we start the new AI game the attractor mode. Um, so looking at game modes so if we look at this ai function essentially what we're going to do is we're going to set the game mode to our attractor player so this is another in instance of a strategy pattern that we have mm -hmm. over here so essentially in this strategy we have two different things we have an update and a uh, swap players both of these are void now in the update uh in the attractor mode swap players does nothing because we don't have any players actually, um, but uh, we do want to be able to draw the attractor mode here because this is the only in this game mode is the only place that the attractor mode is drawn. So we're going to draw it here. Um, the other ones. So if we look at single player, the update is simply going to do the same thing. It doesn't need to worry about swapping players, so it just doesn't do anything. But for the update function, it does draw player one display. And then if we look at two, this is where things are, have a little more, uh, are a little more interesting. Uh, when we call swap players in two player mode, it will actually do something. It'll update the field to the correct field. So it'll swap fields, it'll swap players, and it will set the wave of the current player. So if player one was on wave three and player two is on wave one, if we go back to player two, it needs to go back to wave one. So that's what we have it doing here. And it's also drawing the display for player one and player two. Um, so now this is the other thing that I wasn't able to get to necessarily because I had implemented in a particular way and then I realized that I didn't actually swap scenes. So currently there is no scene swapping, which I'm aware is a, a, a minor deduction as you mentioned in class, but for the fact that it works without it, I didn't feel like I, I didn't have time to reinvent the entire system. Um, to accommodate this small change that doesn't seem like it would do anything beneficial to our game. So I didn't put it that high on the priority list. But what does happen is currently it will start an AI game um, and it'll basically swap the player type to controller type to AI. Now in this AI controller type, 
Uh, this is probably the quickest way to get there. Um, two, 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 two. Go to definition. Um, in AI mode, we're updating the ship's AI. Um, so this is basically telling it, we have a class called ship AI, and all this is doing is a very, very basic thing, or wrong way. Let's just go to, do, 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 go to definition. This is, all this is doing is saying, we have two booleans, up and left. If up, move up. If not up, move down. Um, that's all we're doing. And then these move up and move downs are technically Booleans, which basically say, can we move up? If we can move up, then it's true. If we can't move up, it's false. And so when it's down, we just have to invert it like that. So uh, that's all we have for the ship AI. But anyway, back to the game mode um, or the game manager. Um, we're changing that to AI. Now, specifically, if we go back to here and then we go back to update AI, go to definition. Um, this is basically saying if we have pressed the one key, start a single player game from the game manager. If we start a two player game, start a, a two player game. Uh, that's all that's happening. Um, and then we can use this because the moment we hit it, we're done. Uh, we're out of AI mode because if we take a look at our game manager, it's immediately going to change the controller type back to keyboard or whatever the player wants. But I didn't, it wasn't necessary to change that game mode right away. So uh, when we go into uh, player one or player two, we're going to unmute. But when we head back to attractor, we mute. And then regardless of what game mode we're in, we start a new game. Uh, additionally, we have this thing initializing single, double, and AI uh, players, but that's not super important. And then, of course, in these, we also change the game mode, which we saw the strategy for earlier. So, um, regardless, we're always going to start a new game. And when we start a new game, do, 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 oh, let me just go to the definition there. Go to definition. Uh, when we start a new game, it's going to set a few things, or it's going to set the wave uh, back to zero for everyone. And that's going to start a new round. Now, this start a new round uh, can be called from multiple places, which is why we have it separated out like this. Um, it's a, it's basically going to, at the start of a new round, it's going to spawn a centipede. It's going to spawn a solo centipede based on our wave manager. So for that specific wave, it's going to read in how long it needs to be, how fast it is, and all of that. Uh, it's also going to tell the mushroom field that we have a new round. All that does is it makes sure that when we spawn, there isn't a mushroom in the spawning position. It's just going to delete that mushroom. Um, additionally, we have, uh, it starts a new wave, a uh, new round. So this is just all the resetting functions, and it kills all the bullets on the screen as well. So, so uh, using, again, um, the strategy of different uh, function pointers, uh, what we're doing here is we are we have basically uh, different update functions. So if we come to the if we go back to our diagram and look at this, currently we have a priv update. This is a void uh, a void function pointer. So if we come here, it's just like this. And we have three different update types. We have a regen loop, a main loop, and a high score loop. So the the main one is, the, uh, namely, the main loop. Um, so if we come take a look at the loop of the function or what's happening the majority of the time, um, we're updating the centipede manager, the critter controller, although this is probably better known as a critter manager. Um, and every frame, we're basically, or every time this updates, we're asking, do we need to start the next wave? If we do need to start the next wave, and this here is a complicated, not, this has a few different factors that it needs to consider. Um, if all of the centipedes from all of the different heads and all are gone, then we start a new wave, get a new player, uh, get a new wave, um, and everything you read here. Um, again, this is another place where I'm reading it now and it probably could benefit from an observer pattern. Uh, but that is not how I implemented it, unfortunately. So, 
Uh, looking forward, uh, the main loop will then always uh, call the score manager to process its scores every frame, and then it will call the animation manager to update. And the animation manager, which we'll get to in a little bit, is just the thing that's handling all the explosions and whatnot, any miscellaneous animation. So. We also have this regeneration loop. Now this regeneration loop is when the mushrooms are regenerating uh, between deaths. So it's gonna call this load death screen. It's also gonna process scores and update, but this load death screen here, go to definition. Um, uh, basically what this is gonna, every four frames, it's going to do the column thing that I mentioned earlier with the mushrooms. It's gonna call a new column. And then when it gets to the end of the columns, it's just gonna start the new round. And it's going to set the loop back to the correct place. Additionally, it's going to call swap players. Now, for, unless we're in two-player mode, this doesn't do anything. But if we are in two-player mode, it'll do all the commands we said previously. So, uh, talking about the animation manager over here, uh, it's not a hugely complicated thing. It's just a manager hooked up to a pool uh, that has a animation class. Uh, the animation manager holds a list or a vector of animations to play. Um, and so we have a few different requests that we can make. So we can request a death animation, a recycle, uh, regeneration animation, and the spider death animation. So the spider death animation here, um, let's go to the private, private, private requests here. So, uh, what these are doing is that these are getting a very specific place on a sprite sheet. So essentially we're initializing uh, the animation to a very specific place on the sprites, uh, sprite, uh, the sprite sheet. So um, with requesting the regeneration animation, um, we get it from the spawn sheet. Um, that is basically um, uh, the mushroom spawning she uh, sheet. As far as I could tell, it's the same animation. Um, so that's what I have there. Um, so essentially, but what all these do is that they push back this animation onto the sprite list and all of them call this function, uh, which is request animation helper. And this is just going to request it from the object pool and set its external management to recycle animation because they are game. The animations themselves are game objects. Um, so we have a few different things. Um, this right here takes in a distance as well. And this just gives you the appropriate number. Um, these frame 34 is the 900, 20 is the uh, the 606 is the uh, uh, the 300. So I think I got that right. Um, and then additionally, it's going to set this alarm. So all this alarm is doing is it's saying in one second, get rid of this animation. Um, not all the animations work like this. Some of the animation. Uh, if there is an alarm, it's basically saying stay on for longer than you should. Otherwise, when it gets to the end of the animation, it'll just go away automatically. And I'll show you that in action in the animations page. So uh, going over to the animations page right here, uh, we have the position in the body. And if we go to the update function here, um, we're basically checking, are we on the last animation frame? And is the alarm, is alarm zero not going anymore? If both of those conditions are true, we mark it for destroy. Uh, regardless, we're going to update the body and set the position, and then this will just draw it. So uh, that's all the animation really does. We have this initialization here, uh, which is just setting some basic components, uh, position setting, etc. So uh, the animation manager, not too complicated, uh, but uh, necessary to show. Uh, and then, of course, um, we have an object pool hooked up to our manager. Uh, it wasn't completely necessary that uh, we had a separate factory that the manager called, as it's a very simple operation. So all that's happening here is that the manager itself is asking the object pool. It's putting the requests in itself. So looking at the wave manager, now, um, Currently we have a manager here uh, of the waves and this handles all the different waves uh, and it is also parsing a file. So I showed you earlier that we have this wave settings.txt file. So essentially it's going to parse this file and read it in once and only once. So we can see that, I think it's this one. 
Yep, because there's a file name, go to definition. It has this long parsing formula. Basically what it's doing is it's using a colon as a delimiter. Um, it is then it's parsing the first half, which is the file net or the uh, the function name or the, the, the identifier, basically the label, and the other half is the value. And it's just going to parse those things. Um, and over here, it's going to actually put that into usable data. So uh, looking at the wave of the diagram again. Um, so we have all the waves. Um, and it's going to create a series of waves. Now, each of these waves it has a corresponding thing, but they all have a default value. So theoretically, you don't actually have to give the wave settings anything. It's just not going to make a very interesting game. Um, but each of these different settings can, is uh, controlled uh, by somewhere or is asked for by somewhere different in the program, which is why we have all these gits. Otherwise, the wave isn't too exciting. Um, additionally, here uh, we have our list of waves, and uh, we have an iterator just pointing to the current wave. We don't need anything more complicated than that. So um, that's a, all we have for the wave systems. And at the end, I will 100% show that these waves are only read in once and only once. So uh, taking a look at the sound manager here, we have a bunch of different sounds, buffers for those sounds, and a lot of uh, functions to play those sounds. So uh, essentially we have this right, where I'll go to the function. Uh, we have request sound and then a sound itself. So all these functions are just calling request sound on a particular sound. So we have all of our sounds here and this, the way we're doing it here makes it really easy to add more sounds. The only places we have to add sounds are in this file here. We don't actually have to do anything anywhere else. So uh, we just need to add a function, a static function, a buffer, and a sound. And that's it. And then this request sound will send off a request. I'll show you here. Uh, we'll send off a request to the sound mode to be played. Now, the sound mode has is a strategy pattern that has two implementations sound mode active sound mode mute sound mode mute it's play function nothing doesn't do anything uh however if we go back to our class diagram there we go uh our play function here does play the sound now what's this is this looks like it's awful but all that's happening here is that it's asking are is the sound uh, a loop sound, if it is a loop sound, get its status, and if it's playing, which we have an enum for, not a boolean, we, we have an enum for, play the sound if it's not already playing. Otherwise, if it's not a loop sound, if it's just an instant sound, just play it. Um, this is to prevent multiple like sounds from playing at once, like when there's two centipedes on the board, two centipedes playing, because that gets really annoying. So that's what we have there. Um, so yeah, uh, looking ahead and on to the final element um we have our glyph manager our score display basically the things that are displaying the score so uh essentially we are using a flyweight pattern here so we're not updating all of the time the new glyphs every single iteration so firstly we have a glyph sheet now this glyph sheet is a parent class for many different types of sprite sheets. Turns out the only one we have right now is our score font, but we might, if we had additional fonts in the future or different sprite sheets in the future, this could 100% handle them. But right now we only have a score font. Um, the only thing that the score font really needs to do is pass this function char to index. This is how do, uh, it's telling the, it's asking the glyph sheet, how do we interpret you? So this char to index on this one is saying, if you give me this char, this is what I'll print out. Uh, and this is, these positions are in accordance with the sprite sheet that we're given for the font. Um, and so everything here is going to be referencing this font here. So um, additionally, uh, we have, where are we? We have the string font here. Now the string font is pointing to a type of glyph sheet but we're actually going to be passing it a score font. So if we come here to 
sprite strain all that together. Um, uh, but yeah, we're essentially going to be passing it a sc score font as its reference. Now, um, we have this thing here called sprite string. Now, what a sprite string has, and now we can come back here, a sprite string has the text in string form, the list of glyphs, the position of the front, and then a draw direction, which is an enum that just is forward or backwards. So essentially what will happen is we have these different functions here. So we have generate symbol list. So if we go to the definition here, uh, this is what's going to happen every time. So everything that needs to regenerate or re-update that list calls generate symbol list. And it's just going to take all of our variables that we have, our text, our position, everything. It's just going to regenerate those. Um, then we have a few things like updating the string, which will just update the string, the direction, and the position. So updating these things will refresh the glyph. But other than that, we're not, we are not calling generate symbol list every single time because, uh, and that's using the flyway pattern. So if we look back at our diagram, we have a bunch in our score display, we're using sprite string a lot. And so each of these sprite strings is a different string of text that is shown on the screen. A lot of these are, so these are the player one score, player two score, you, you can read these. But a lot of these are for the attractor mode. And these are actually called from our game mode to be drawn. Uh, because it is different depending on which game mode you have. So there, those things are making the request, and this is taking those requests and drawing the appropriate request. So additionally, yeah, as I showed earlier, we have a score font as our reference, um, which is a type of glyph sheet. So if we actually come to our... Do, 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 let's just go here. Um, in our creation, we create a all of these things. Now, there are some numbers here that appear to be hard-coded in, but I can assure you they're not magic numbers. These numbers, as this text will does not change, uh, this 4.0 is rep meant to represent half of the length of this text. So this is 11, so half rounded down is five. Uh, this is, 19 I believe I'm not going to count that but essentially these are offsets um, for that all this text and so that's what a lot of these numbers are for as well so um, so essentially we initialize all of these as they are at very specific points on the screen um, and then what we do uh, are yeah so we initialize that and every time we uh, let me move to it. Every time we call to, uh, where are we? Uh, every time we call an update on something, it is updating. So if we call update lives, for instance, on player one, um, we are essentially going to pass this to our sprite string to update. It's going to update the sprite string. And so the next time we call to draw it, it's going to be correct. So these are all sent to a draw. Um, which is sent to our game mode, which our game mode is then uh, putting in our draw function uh, in our game manager. So, uh, yeah, that's what we have. And then finally, we have this new high score mode as well. Uh, this is when we hit a new high score. Um, this score display currently uh, will process our initials. Um, it will not actually take the command. See that we're passing it a character. Uh, we're going to be passing it a character, and we have to use uint32. Uh, that's because that's what the uh, uh, SFML uses uh, for the reading of uh, text input. Uh, so we'll pass it the character, and then it itself will process the character and then be able to put it on screen at the initials text. So that's all we have for that system. So currently I have the game running. But when I click here, it's uh, uh, it's going to hide it. But essentially, I right now have it printing out every time it's making a new head, a new centipede, when it's registering that head, and when it's destroying it. So we can see that the segments are being sent back to the object pool and back to the factory. We're not creating spurious um, entities that we don't need to. 
which means that our cleanup process is not a huge list or or it's not a bunch of news and deletes it's simply a couple of news and a couple of deletes at the end um, so that's happening here uh, we're gonna kill that program and we can see that there are no memory leaks here. Uh, I'm going to show you now a few things uh, that on are supposed to only happen once. Only happen once. So uh, I placed a breakpoint here at offsets. So this will only happen seven times and then the game will run. So if we come here, it's gonna stop once, twice, three, four, five, six, seven, and then it will never hit that again. This is ensuring that the offsets are never recalculated. I can do a bunch of things, not recalculated. So that's that proof. Next, I'll prove to you that the high scores are only read in once. So I'm gonna put a, a breakpoint here. Read in once, then never again. Uh, additionally, while we're here, I'll also show you that on terminate, when we populate the files, uh, it's only happening at the end. It's not happening any other time. So we're here, stops here, terminates. So those, there's that proof. Uh, this will show you that the wave data is only read in once. Boom. Never again. Boom. All right. To prove that all my singletons are actually singletons, you will note that they are, uh, so there's an example of a singleton where I have all these functions that should be private, that are private, static voids on public and uh, non-statics or on uh, private. Um, I will just quickly flash through all of these, although I have about 20 singletons, so I'm not gonna go in depth with each one. So here we have the wave manager set up correctly, animation manager, sound manager, game manager, ship AI, bullet manager, profile manager, mushroom controller, mushroom object pool. Uh, there's a lot more here. Animation manager, I might have already gone through. The Oh, it puts these in alphabetical order. I'm just going to close out of these then. Mushroom field manager. Mushroom object pool. High score manager. Score manager. Critter controller. Critter factory. Critter object pool. Critter manager. So all these are set up correctly. Thank you for watching. Um, if there are any things that I missed in this video, uh, unless I explicitly mentioned it in the video, everything, as far as I could tell with the checklist, is complete. So if there's something I missed in this video, running my most my current build should be able to prove that. Um, additionally, uh, I do recognize, especially in going through a complete comprehensive guide, that there were a few things that I probably didn't do the most optimally. Um, as I've never worked on a project of this scale before, and it's been an interesting learning experience, and I'll have more to come in my post-mortem questionnaire. Thank you for listening.